Thank you guys for being here today. Um, before I get started, I gotta set up a couple of props. So I am really excited um, that the Buchanan family came out. Um, it is a blessing. They are close family friends. And Jacob said, "Hey, you're preaching. I want to come out and um, support you." So and his parents came. So thank you guys so much for being here. It's a blessing to look out um, in the audience and see. Um, familiar faces. I know I know all of you too, but um, to, to have the Buchanans here is also a great blessing. Um, so what we're going to look at this morning, my title of the sermon this morning is Don't Be Deceived by Worldly Wisdom. And so what I want to do is dig into the wisdom that we find in the book of James. <laughs> now, James is often referred to as the wisdom literature of the New Testament. And it's a book that is full of godly wisdom. And so um, my goal for us today is to look at every bit of wisdom that we find in the book of James. I just want to break it all down. And so James is five chapters long, so I thought it would be appropriate to spend about an hour per chapter. Um, (laughs) Okay, why are you all laughing? Okay, no. I am somewhat kidding, um, somewhat. (laughs) I do want to. I want to look at all of the wisdom in the book of James, but I want to kind of look from um, a higher view. Uh, James speaks about wisdom four um, four times. He says the word directly um, in the book of James, and so I want to look at wisdom itself as spoken of in the book of James. And so, I think most of us would understand wisdom to be a good thing. If I were to ask you guys who wants to be wise, I feel most of you would raise your hand. Yes, I want to be wise. But how do we know that we're wise? And so the verse, the key passage that we're going to look at today in the first verse in that key passage, James actually talks about how we can know someone is wise. The first verse in the passage is James 3.13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. (coughs) So if you look closely at what James is saying, he's saying that you can tell a person is wise by their actions, by their good life, by the deeds they do. And these deeds will be done in humility, and this humility comes from wisdom. So my goal for us today is to understand how wisdom produces humility, and then how humility in turn leads to meaningful action. Let me open us with a word of prayer before we jump in. Dear God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak this morning. God, I pray that you are glorified through the words that come out of my mouth, God. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is at work and that you will work in the hearts um, of the audience here today, God. God, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start today by looking at the difference between the world's wisdom and God's wisdom. Now, the Bible is clear that true wisdom comes from God. We saw in our call to worship verse that Pastor Dan read this morning from Daniel um, that true wisdom comes from God. There's another verse that I would like to look at. It's Proverbs 2.6. Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, false wisdom comes from trusting something other than God as the source of truth. I'd like for us to look at 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19. That verse says, let no man deceive himself. And I want to pause real real quick right here. Deceive is a word that we're going to see often today as we're speaking. So it says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. So false wisdom is actually connected to the fallen nature of man. It starts with us being deceived. If you think about it, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan. And this is something that continues to happen today. This deceit leads us to seeking to glorify ourselves rather than God. And this is actually foolishness and not wisdom. Proverbs 18.2 says, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, 
but delight in airing their own opinions. And this is where we find ourselves in the book of James. James is writing to a people that are struggling to decipher between the world's so-called wisdom and God's wisdom. It's a culture that's heavily influenced by the Roman and Greek culture. And in this culture, they put a lot of stock in man's accomplishments. They put a lot of stock also in man's ability to reason. Uh, if you think about this, this is the culture that produced Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. This is a culture that also led to something known as Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means to know. And Gnostic, Gnostics claim to possess this <coughs> elevated knowledge, this higher truth, this deeper understanding of God. And this was actually a dangerous heresy that was threatening the early church. It's threatening these people that James is writing to. So what James wants is he wants these people to stop being influenced by this so-called wisdom of man. He wants them to stop being deceived. And he wants them to follow after godly wisdom. Now, godly wisdom is often countercultural. This means it goes against the self-serving wisdom of this world. And so to help get some context on the next few verses of our passage, I need to actually jump back to James chapter 1. And James chapter 1 starts by James introducing himself. So he introduces himself, and then he talks about, uh, he's, he introduces his audience, who he's speaking to. And he's speaking to uh, believers who are facing persecution. And here James says something that goes contrary to the wisdom of man. And he does this often throughout the book, if you read through the book. But this is the first place where I see him doing this. James encourages them by telling them that this persecution is actually a good thing. Now think about this. You know, this is not um, man's wisdom. Man's wisdom would tell you that if you're going through persecution, obviously that's not a good thing. But he tells them that this is actually a good thing. He says it's a good thing because it helps them to mature as Christians. And so in verse 5, we're gonna, where we're going to pick up, um, James connects this maturity to godly wisdom. He says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So James knows that godly wisdom is going to help them to understand that God is the one who is in control of their circumstances. And even if from one's human perspective things look bad, this persecution that they're going through looks bad, God can use it for his good. Next, James, uh, James addresses their need to trust God's plan. And so this is verses 6 through 8. Verse 6 through 8 says, But when he asks, and this he in this verse is the one who asks for wisdom, so it says, But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So what this, this double-minded in this verse is a key principle that we need to understand. It's really this idea of being focused or having these two things. Okay, So you have one thing over here and one thing over here. And trying to focus on both of those things at the same time. And because you're so focused on, or trying to focus on both of those, you're never able to move forward. So this is really this concept of being double-minded. And so what James is saying is that one's faith in God's ability to do what God says God is going to do will determine the confidence they have to move forward. So if they believe that God can really do what God says he's going to do, then they can trust this plan and pursue that. Without this faith, they're never going to take action. They're going to let their thoughts sway their decisions, and they're going to be stuck in this double-mindedness. Instead, they need to trust that God's plan is good. And so to see this, we're going to skip down to verses 16 through 17 of chapter 1. Verse 16 starts out by saying, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So here James warns them not to be deceived, but rather to know that God's plan can be trusted because God is the giver of good and perfect gifts and he is the source of light and truth. So in essence, what James is saying, he's saying that in God's presence, 
the world's shadows will dissipate and the truth will be revealed that God is the source of everything good. Now, knowing that God is the source of everything good actually ties into this humility that comes from wisdom that we saw in the verse, uh, the first verse that we read this morning. Once again, James is saying something that goes contrary to the wisdom of man. Um, if you think about this, um, humility um, coming from wisdom. If I were, you know, if I were to tell you, you're you're smart, you know, it seems like that would produce in you some pride, right? The more I know, the more prideful I'm going to be. So how does humility produce, or how does wisdom produce humility? It seems to go contrary to the way that we would think. Well, the reason why humility comes from wisdom is because wisdom belongs to God. We like to gloat about how much we know, um, but true wisdom is the recognition of how little we really know. It's the recognition that God is the one with the good plan for our life, and our role is just to follow God's leading. Since true wisdom comes from God, we can't take any credit for it. Therefore, true wisdom produces humility. The Greek word in the New Testament translated humility literally means lowliness of mind. And I want you to think of this lowliness of mind as compared to this Gnosticism. This Gnosticism was this elevated way of thinking, this higher truth, this deeper understanding of God. And so um, this humility is completely the opposite of that. James is saying that humility is what we should be uh, striving for, this lowliness of mind. And this leads to my next point, that humility leads to meaningful action. So the verse that we've looked at so far is James 3.13. James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So action that is not preceded by humility is perceived by us as accomplished in our own strength. Let me say that again. Action that is not preceded by humility is perceived by us as accomplished in our own strength. And I want to use an illustration for this. Now, Nick got kind of roped into this illustration this morning because Alyssa didn't show up. So um, Nick doesn't know that he volunteered, um, but he did. So <laughs> so <coughs> all right. <coughs> Excuse me. So Nick's. Man, mm. <laughs> Nick, your job is going to be pretty easy. You can have a seat till I tell you what you're going to do. So. Okay, he has no clue. It's going to be really hard. I'm going to have you up here preaching the rest of the sermon. So, okay, no, uh, your job. It's going to be pretty easy. Okay, so Nick's role um, is pretty easy. All I want Nick to do is to come up here and to pick up this basket of candy. And Nick, you can take the candy. You can eat the candy. It's yours. You can do what you want with it. So, seems pretty easy, right? Okay, Nick, come up here. Grab this basket of candy. It's it's yours to take. Okay, you can do a little faster. Over here. Okay. All right, it's yours. Go for it. That's all. No, no, take it back. I don't want to watch you eat the candy. So, okay, so let's give Nick a round of applause. I mean, that was that was amazing. I mean, I have never seen anybody pick up a basket of candy quite like Nick did. So that was great job, Nick. Uh, we really appreciate that. So, okay, so Nick is an example of us acting without humility, okay? Someone without acting without humility does something based on what they can gain. This is often what motivates our actions. Or we do it because we like the praise. We like praise. And things that we've done in our own strength, we like to take credit for. But the truth is, is that we deserve none of the credit because it all belongs to God. And in our own strength, we could actually accomplish nothing. And so this leads to my second volunteer. Um, this is going to be Joe. And Joe's role is to do something a little bit different. Okay, So Joe, come up on stage. And we're going to start by um, Joe putting this blindfold on. Okay, so come, 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 come. Okay, so Joe's going to come up here. Now, Joe's role is actually going to be the opposite. Let's see how quickly you can do this. Okay, so Joe's role is going to be to 
hand out candy, okay? So I'm going to give Joe this basket right here, and I'm going to ask Joe to hand out candy. You ready, Joe? Yeah. Okay, Joe is ready. So Joe, here's the basket. It's right in front of you. There you go. Okay, so go ahead, hand out the candy. Oh, there's no candy in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's not. So, do you want me to do something about that? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you want me to put candy in it? Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me give you some candy, Joe. That might help. Yeah. So, all right. So here's some candy. You know what, Joe? It's going to be a little bit difficult to hand out this candy with the blindfold on. So let me let me take that off for you. So, okay, that'll probably help. I'll even put your glasses on for you. So. There you go. Okay. No, we're good. So, okay, Joe, go ahead. You can hand out the candy. Thank you so much, Joe. So, so if our actions are truly a result of wisdom, we have to come to the place where we realize that we don't have anything to give. Okay, Joe had to realize I don't have any candy to give. I, you know, I, I, what am I supposed to do about this? So you must come to the place where you realize you don't have anything to give. This starts by recognizing our place, and it starts with humility. When we give God the credit that God is due, he receives the glory that he is due. You can't have actions without humility. I mean, clearly Nick had actions. He came up here, he grabbed the basket. Um, but those actions won't glorify God. Good works without humility is using God's resources for our glory. Let me state that again. Good works without humility is us using God's resources for our glory. So in the last few verses of our passage today, I want to wrap things up with some awesome news. It wasn't quite five hours, was it? So, um, so this awesome news is that when we give God the glory he is due, we reap blessing. When your life is over, what do you want to have accomplished? If we're focused on security or comfort or worldly stature, our actions are going to reflect this. And most of the time, we think that our selfish ambitions and God's will can somehow coexist. But the truth is, is we can't focus on our own selfish ambitions and God's will for our life without being double-minded, this double-mindedness that we spoke about in James chapter 1. And so this leads us to the final verses of our passage today. I want to read 3, through, uh, three 14 through 16 right now. It says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. We see here that selfish ambition is not connected to godly wisdom. God is not concerned with our achievement. But let's continue on, verses 17 through 18. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So wisdom that is from God will result in these good actions. God's wisdom is a blessing because it allows us to live the good life that God intended for us to live, lives that reap a harvest of righteousness, and lives that reflect his power and his goodness. I want to close with this final verse, Proverbs 19.8. It says, He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. That good is God, amen? Amen. <laughs> All right, let me close this with a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak this morning. God, we were deceived in the garden by Satan, God. Not us personally, but Adam and Eve, God. But we've continued to be deceived, God. We thought that somehow this sin, God, would help us to be on equal plane with you, to understand what you understood, God. But God, this was a lie, and this lie separated us from you. And God, you loved us so much that you made a way. You made a way for our sins to be forgiven. God, you made a way by sending the way, the truth, the life. 
you sent Jesus, your son, to come down and to pay the penalty for that sin, God, and to restore this relationship. God, you helped us to see the truth, that you're the one with the good plan for our life, God, and our role is just to follow your leading. God, I pray that we are doing that. God, that we are seeking your wisdom. God, that we're spending time in your word, that we're spending time talking to you through prayer, that we're spending time with other believers, God, (laughs) that have also spent time in your word, God, and growing in the knowledge of who you are, God. God, I pray that we will be people who are not just taking this word, God, and absorbing it, but we're taking this word and putting it into action, God, so that we can live the good lives that you intended, lives that glorify you, God, lives that reap a harvest of righteousness. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, and I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.